Well, welcome to Black History Conversations. My name's Liz Millman, and I'm part of the Learning Links International team. We've got my colleague uh, Simon Fringo from Belong Nottingham and Marcia um, from Black Heritage Walks Network. So. Um, and other guests. So we're really, really pleased also to welcome Ajibedi Samuel Idowu, because uh, I found out about um, a wonderful review he did very recently. But anyway, this in this session, we're going to uh, welcome a number of authors. So we'll see who, who arrives. Um, Lauren Scott, um, author of Dangerous Freedom, said he may join us, and Helen Backworth, author of The uh, Butterfly and the Bee also. These are two books that we've talked about in previous series, but the thing that I'm interested in at the moment is historical fiction and something for the Easter holidays. So uh, a way of learning and also enjoying and getting involved in a book. We'll also be hearing uh, a little later on from June Elizabeth White Smith Gully. She's the international Windrush and advocate. Um, she is an international Windrush advocate or representative. Um, and we're also, as I say, going to be hearing about a brilliant new African textbook. And um, well, it's not new, it's been around a few years, but we want to hear from Hajibedi Samuel Iwodu um, from Ibadan, Nigeria, who's joined us. And he's going to be telling us um, about the book and about himself, introducing himself, and we're delighted with that. We're just going to go on to the next slide though. Because I'm in Australia, we always start any meetings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which, we, which I'm currently living, the Wunjiri people of the Kulin Nation, their elders, past, present and future. And we also always recognize that this land belongs to the sovereign people of the First Nations. It was never ceded, it always was, and it always will be. Sadly, for the last few weeks, we've had to also remember the people of Ukraine. I haven't actually spent much time watching the news today, but the stories that have been coming out throughout the week have been so sad. And I know we stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Right, now I'm going to stop sharing and I'm just going to um, welcome Ajibedi Samuel. Ajibedi, you've just disappeared at this moment in time. I love it. <laughs> Ajibedi, are you there? Okay, he'll join us in a few minutes, I'm sure, when he comes back. So, um, Marcia, I know you've got a really important meeting today. Tell us what's happening in Birmingham today. Yes, hello, everybody. So we, there's a movement called the World Reimagined um, Movement and basically it was um, created in response to the fact that the um, English government, unlike the Welsh government, is not embracing the whole thing of including um, what we call BAME, Black and Asian, and presence into the curriculum. So basically, um, uh, uh, there's a singer called Michelle Gale, who was big in the sort of 80s. Uh, she has formed with some corporate organizations such as Sky Television to create our own um, curriculum that does include the Black and Asian um, presence. And it's basically, um, the launch is today, so that community organisations, schools, colleges and universities can start incorporating the resources um, that have been created to tell this story. So I'll put the website address in the chat and then it's easier for you to, to when you link into it, to see exactly. But it's a, it's a big thing right now. It's wonderful. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, Marcia, um, for giving us that information. Now, Ajibedi, before we lose you again, um, <laughs> I'm just going to uh, share the screen and just um, introduce you a bit more formally. So um, the, the thing that attracted my attention, and you may want to talk about this or you may want to tell us other things, but I'm really interested in the history textbook. We've been... Um, fortunate enough to have Professor, Sat 
Professor Sati Fwachat from Joss University uh, join us on a number of occasions and he's told us about the fact that history was not ta taught in Nigeria for a number of years and for a number of reasons. So when I found the history textbook, uh, which is um, published by the West African Senior School Certificate Examination, um, and it's freely available, it's easy to download, um, and I read your reference about it. So I did a bit of Googling research and came across you, invited you, we've been talking on email. So you're a history teacher at Adesina College in Ibadan, and you're also a PhD candidate at the History Department of the University of Ibadan. I'm especially excited because as a small girl, as a young girl, I was only 12, I lived in Ibadan for a short time, so I sometimes remind folks about that because it was an incredible time in my life. So we're, I'll stop sharing, but if we want to come back to this to talk about mm. anything, we always can. So, everybody, Samuel, tell us a little bit about yourself then and what you're doing, what your interests are. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm really happy to be part of this meeting. My name is um, Ajibadi Samuel Ido, but you can call me Samuel. Um, I'm a history teacher in Ibadan. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. We can hear you. It's quite difficult. Oh. <laughs> Do your best. It's for network. So, um, as I said, I am Adibadi Samuel Ido from Ibadan. Um, I'm a history teacher. I teach um, in a secondary school, a private secondary school here in Ibadan. And at the same time, I am um, taking my PhD uh, in the department of the University of Ibadan. Hope you can still hear me. The, the line's really flaky. Um, do you want to maybe, go out and come back in? Maybe I the video. Say Did it I again? turn off the video? And, uh, that, that can help, Samuel, yes. If you, yeah, if cut you out your video and just talk. That might be easier. Let me, let me try. Please. Sometimes it gives more strength to the signal, doesn't it? And I'll just welcome some of our other colleagues. Lawrence, I'm delighted that you're yeah. able to join you us. Said that. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Oh, all right. Um, um, I, I said I thank you so very much for making me part of this meeting. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. All right. Uh -huh. My name is Ajibadi Samuel. Uh, you can call me Samuel. Thank I teach you. history at Additional College, Ibadan. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm also a PhD candidate at the University of Ibadan. Um, uh, yeah, you yeah, were so many years ago. <laughs> uh, I actually um, stumbled on um, the history of West Africa for senior secondary school certificate examination. You know, I, I was looking for resources to teach history for my um, um, students who were um, about writing their SSC, Senior School Certificate Examination here in Ibadan. And as you have rightly pointed out, you know, in um, Nigeria here, I don't know the offense they have committed, that they have written off the teaching, you know, of history, especially in secondary school. So we had some secondary schools that are actually offering history. Even before it was made from courses, like additional college now where I teach. I've been teaching history in this secondary school for the past 15 years. And uh, history was just made a composite subject, I think about two years ago or thereabouts. And I've been teaching it for more than 14 years, up to 15 years now. So um, in order to, um, bring my students to the realization that they shouldn't lose their sense of history because oftentimes when I teach them, most of them will want to go for government as a subject or other subjects like geography. They didn't find history interesting in spite of the fact that I tried to make it valuable to them and to make it so interesting. 
So I just discovered that most of them, at the end of the day, they will not do the history uh, at the external examination. So I was now looking for an opportunity that, that makes me prepare the student to write their exam at the external examination level. So I went to Google and I was searching, I was looking for online materials that will make history too attractive to them. And I, I came in contact with uh, the history of West Africa for the United Country School. I didn't even bother about the author. You know, I just fell in love with it. I saw the graphics, the videos, and the pictures. So, you know, fascinating. I brought everything to class and uh, I projected. The first day I projected, even though who were not, you know, some of the students who were not offering history, they decided to join my class by the way, because it was an interactive class. You know, the day I was teaching um, um, the transatlantic slave trade, you know, I opened a particular, you know, video, and uh, they were now looking at it. Some of them were asking me, sir, is this the ship they used in taking our forefathers from Africa? You know, I said, no, 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 this is just a semblance, you know, a semblance of the ship that was, you know, used to transport our forefathers from here. You know, some other, you know, um, graphics and, um, um, and um, materials that I use to teach them. And at the end of the day, the following class, I saw a crowd in my class. What do you want? They said they wanted to have, yeah, they wanted to join the history class. And that was a turning point in my in my career because it, it said I so much fall in love. So it, it's an online resource, but I actually fell in love with it so much so that I started having um, students who were you know, going beyond secondary school history and even enrolling to write history as, as um, the uh, joint admission and matriculation exam in order to be enrolled to have, you know, a, a degree in history. So at least now in the Bible School of History, I have up to, currently, up to those that have graduated, I have up to seven or eight of them from various levels, 100 levels to 400 levels, that I actually took out from this um, um, school that I've been uh, teaching history. But all in all, I just discovered that this textbook, you know, it has made me to bring in students, you know, that had some time to go seen history as a very boring subject and an interesting subject. Uh, this textbook has actually helped me to um, make it an interesting subject. And I became a student for three examinations using this textbook, although I still have some other textbooks that I have, but this also is my main textbook for, for the CHAM and uh, for the uh, West African examination. Uh, examination. All of the why, all, all, all of this why, I've not been having students coming to me to complain that history is a boring subject. Even before the federal government of Nigeria made history a composite subject at um, a junior, secondary school, primary school, and even at the university and at the secondary school level, I have been teaching my history and uh, I have been enjoying it. Copy of this um, textbook. Um, the, uh, when, when I wanted to write my um, testimony, I, I didn't even know that I should write it. A professor of history, Professor Olutayo, addition of from the of history department in UI. He just contacted me that which textbook was I using to teach my students. That there is this man called um, Dr. Vincent Terry Barron, he's one of the authors. He's now in Ibadan here, he's the um, director of the Institute of French Research uh, Studies here in the University of Ibadan. So he gave me, he, he gave him my contact, and Vincent contacted me that how did I find the textbook? And I told him, wow, this textbook is. It's a classic and I've been using it and it has stayed up. And I asked him to write um, a review, which I gladly accepted to do, and I wrote it. Samuel, I'm going to interrupt you. I am I do apologize. The sound is still quite difficult to hear. So I'm just wondering if we could if I can just share the screen and show a little bit about the history textbook um, and just explain right. about it. 
Okay, I, I do apologize. So I, I asked the question, are the hunters telling the story again? Was it really written by um, African authors or is it um, academics in, uh, in London or somewhere writing it? So we, we have here the authors um, at, at the bottom, yeah, the, yeah. the contributors. There's um, a considerable number of people um, with, um, with their names maybe sound as if they are African academics. Is this right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. But the project was funded by the British Arts and Humanities Research Council grant. And it was uh, Dr. Toby Green from King's College London who um, uh, 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 managed to get that, that funding. So that, that is truly fantastic. Maybe we'll be able to follow up with him. Um, and I was just going to show people the different topics that are covered in, in the book. Um, can you read this, folks? We've got the, the introduction, historical biography and it's written beautifully um, and illustrated very well so you just go through all the chapters and this will be really powerful for your students just to be able to access all this information and they can read on if they want to or read back if they want to so there really is a an excellent uh, excellent uh, range of um range there um, and many and sub, some subjects we've covered. So when we're thinking about um, African history, um, what oh sorry, um, what we've looked at is um, this is a bit brief, but um, we've looked at um, the UNESCO project as well. I don't know if you've seen the UNESCO project, the, the um, programs of each country, but that's of the whole of Africa. Um, and then the history of textbook, which is particularly of, um, uh, of Nigeria. And then do you know of um, Grace Orumi Akabani? Um, because she's written a number of articles as well about this whole thing about why there was a a gap in the teaching of, of history in Nigeria. Do you know of Grace Kabani? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sure she's she's very well known. So very well um, known. <laughs> at that point, I'm I'm going to say at the moment, thank you very much indeed. And I think maybe if we do a one-to-one -one Zoom and maybe record something. Um, or maybe, you know, when you're writing, if you're writing an article, perhaps we can, we can share that with people. That would be wonderful. And uh, are you able to stay for the rest of the session that we're doing? Fortunately, I, I have a class now. <laughs> okay, well, don't worry. I'm glad that you're able to join us. And we've made the link now, so we'll be able to, to talk some more. That would be fantastic. Really, really lovely. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to move on now. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to move on um, because we've got a couple of subjects, as I say, we were talking about. I'm just going to ask, um, I can see Unita is a passenger and June Elizabeth furiously driving. So we're not going to ask you to do your presentation, June Elizabeth, yet. We're going to uh, ask if we can talk with uh, with you, Lawrence. That's really lovely. So, how are you, Lawrence? Catch up with us, please. This is your book. Oh, this book's got such a special story for me. Thank you, Lawrence. I can't hear you. Just do the mic bit. Oops, is that better? Yeah. Yes, lovely. Thank you. Yeah. I'm well um, in London and a number of things since I was on, as you kindly let me sort of do a reading and so on, um, have happened with dangerous freedom. But I just pick up on something which the last speaker was saying and the points you've been making about his history texts that, of course, I mean, 
I think when I was teaching, because um, I taught in a sixth form college, um, it was really important that um, that people read novels and poems alongside these history texts. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. Um, to just bring, I don't know, just to kind of bring things to life in a very different kind of way. Um, and I suppose somebody was telling me yesterday that they're actually recommending Dangerous Freedom as a, as a text um, to some schools. But there have been, I don't know whether I should mention this, there have been a number of different things which have happened since I last spoke. And I don't know, um, I did a lecture for Kenwood House called okay. Where Did Dido Get Those Clothes? And that's online now. Um, it's, it's, uh, they've made it into a YouTube and it's on the Kenwood House um, site, actually. Um, so that is one thing that happens. That's very much on the portrait and also the, a sort of a lot of reference to David Dabadeen, who is at Warwick University, his work on Hogarth's Blacks, his, a very early book of his. Um, which was very useful to me in analyzing the portrait of Dido Elizabeth Bell and Elizabeth Murray. So I don't know whether people, it's very easy to find this lecture. Another thing sort of coming up, a very interesting site, which has just been open, well, relatively new site, um, funded by the Royal Literary Fund, is something called a Writer's Mosaic, um, edited by Colin Grant, a Jamaican British um, author, and Gabriel, son, can't get his surname, I never pronounced his surname properly, he's an African novelist, and they're both um, editors of this site, and they bring up, they put a lot of writers on the site who have written short essays, an extract from their work sometimes, and an interview, and that writer has about um, two or three weeks kind of window opportunity on the site. And then the other start, the stuff is archived. So it stays on the site. And it's, I think it's a really interesting venture called Writer's Mosaic. Um, I've just kind of done my stuff to go on to it and it should come up in June sometime, I think. Um, so I think that was useful kind of stuff that's happened. Um, of course, my website has a lot of links to um, interviews and things like that. A lot of discussion actually has come up and I just went back to a lecture I once gave in Guadeloupe, which is about interesting about history, which we're all talking about, and um, fiction. And the whole thing of, you know, I think we talked about it last time, Marina Warner's phrase, um, empathy, that using that sort of fictional empathy, that empathy to interiorize a character, these historical characters to actually get inside of them um, and, and you know, expand and interiorize more than perhaps a historical a history book does. Um, not that I want to put down history books, <laughs> uh, very much, so fascinating to learn that history wasn't taught in Nigeria for ages. That's extraordinary, really. I think it was after the Biafran War, I think right. the government then um, wanted to change the agenda. Yeah, it is interesting though, and I think it's worth following up. Thank then you. you think now, for instance, with the U war in Ukraine, what is actually happening to history right now, an extraordinary sort of history that Putin sort of um, bases his whole reason for um, his, 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 his um, assault on the Ukraine and, 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 and the suppression of history in Russia at the moment, people can't get information. Um, this it's yeah it makes you really think about the this whole importance of both history books and fictions that explore historical subjects um yeah so those are some kind of thoughts i've been having i suppose yes <laughs> okay right. if there's anything else you want me to kind of just um, well, I'm, I'm interested. So I just wondered if I, I could share some of the stuff because I've been 
trying to think about how we're um, how we're helping people to understand black history. And this is one of the, you know, one of the main discussion points that we've been having. And I think your point just now where you said that it's important to read novels as well as poems, as well as the um, academic texts. Yes, and plays so, as well, I mean, all, yes. Yeah. All yeah. imaginative um, literature. So I'm just going to help to catch people up if that's all right, then we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, so this is, if, if you don't know who Dido Bell is, Dido is the lady on the left. Um, and what's the name of the lady on the, the right? I've forgotten That's the name. Elizabeth Murray. Who Elizabeth was a, Murray. Yes, yeah, so Dido was illegitimate child of um, John Lindsay, who was the nephew of Lord Mansfield, who lived at Kenwood House. Uh, so they are cousins, but Dido is mixed race and illegitimate, yeah, right. so to speak, as, as yeah. Yeah, and her story has been told many times, including in a, a film and um, including, um, you know, in your work and, and the work of a number of other people. It's yes. an absolutely fascinating story. So I can only, you know, recommend uh, uh, your story. Uh, I read it in one night. It was a long, <laughs> long night, but <laughs> I, had a, I had a special reason. We had a terrible storm here one night. So I remember I, you uh, saying that, yes. The opportunity to um, really uh, immerse myself in the book. It's a marvellous story and it re you really feel as if you've been in that time, in that history and understanding how London was in that history. All right, the slide that I've got up at the moment is, um, I just wanted to introduce a guy who I haven't contacted, but I might, Dr. Joseph Holbrook. Now he's a lecturer at um, Florida International University. And uh, he says, historical fiction, fiction, historical fiction, an alternative insight into the culture, society, and context of a historical period, engaging your imagination and creating a storyline. So the book that um, he is talking about in this YouTube video, which you can have the link and watch, um, is James Minchner's book on the Caribbean, which I expected to have by me somewhere, but it still, must still be by my bed. It's an enormously thick book yeah. and it's mm -hmm. um, written quite a while ago. And some of the language um, in the book is, you know, makes you uh, flinch rather the terminologies they use the terminologies you might have been using 20 years ago which aren't considered perhaps pc now um but what dr joseph holbrook explains in his introductory lecture for his students is he introduces the value of historical fiction and advises his students on how to be able to choose and read historical fiction, but also particularly this book on book Caribbean, um, which I have to say I got from an op shop, which is an Australian term for a charity shop. So I got my copy there. So that was was fortunate. And I, I found it really, really difficult to read and I couldn't understand why. But once I'd heard Dr. Joseph Holbrook's introduction, it all made sense. So that, that's what I wanted to share with you there. Um, uh, and um, here um, gives some of the, the subject matter, which is, is fascinating. I've read two chapters at the moment. So, you know, you, you're, you must be honored, Lawrence. <laughs> Not a very good reader. So I read, I read the Hedge of Croton, which is the invasion of the Car um, by the Caribs on the Arawak homelands in the Caribbean, and that was just fascinating. And I have pictures in my mind of how it was. And this Hedge of Croton, Croton is a, a tropical plant that has such beautifully coloured colored leaves, and it's so well described. So that was really absolutely fascinating. And then after um, we'd been talking um, uh, one of the sessions um, about the time 
Oh no, um, I'm particularly interested in the time after emancipation, and um, and one of the uh, yeah, it's number eleven, martial law, the Morant Bay Rebellion, and the following legal battle between John Stuart Mill and Alfred Tennyson, which is fascinating, and I find just reading the the plain history, this is a particularly awful story. Um, and, um, and, and it's still awful when you read it as, as fiction, but you can begin to think and begin to see also how the arguments of the um, British officials were, um, then, um, were then furthered uh, in Britain. So a very interesting how it was in, in Jamaica, the Moran Bay Rebellion was in Jamaica, and uh, also in the, um, in the few years afterwards in the UK. So that was quite fascinating. So I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. And, and just to say, I found that, um, that fascinating. So uh, we also have another author with us, Lawrence, if I can um, just ask you to um, just, hold on and we can go back to some further discussion. Bunmi, are you able to hear us okay today? Bunmi Anisan? Yes, yes. Hi, everybody. Hello. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. I can hear you really well. That's really lovely. Um, Bunmi is also an author and uh, Bunmi, you, you're going to have to help me out here because I wasn't sure if you were going to be joining us or not, so I haven't made any notes. The book that I thought was your autobiography, and I do apologise and have to chuckle here, was actually a fiction, <laughs> so a book based on your grandmother's life, I understand. And that story is called The Three... Three Women. Three Women. Yeah. yeah. Would you, historical, you yeah. Want to make a comment about writing historical fiction then? And oh, just that, that uh, yeah, just that I've always been fascinated by history all my life. And so um, at one point I decided to, um, to write a story um, of a, about a family and then look at the three generations of women in that family um, through history and how, you know, and the kind of issues they were contending with as women living in the city of Lagos which uh, was a, a colonial melting point uh, um, at one point. And I was blessed in having had a grandmother who grew up in, during that era, who had actually told me a lot of stories about her childhood in Lagos. And um, I was able to back that up with, uh, with research. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry Samuel has left, um, but- no, he's in, back again, actually, he's back again. Back again, okay. And then um, at the time when I was doing the research, the Daily Times had a very rich archive, um, which I was able to, to draw from. I had access to newspapers from the early 19, uh, 1920s, you know, and so that gave me a bit of, uh, a bit of meat, a bit of background about what the lifestyle in Lagos was. It was a project I thoroughly enjoyed working on, <laughs> um, on, on Three Women. <laughs> That's fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. So, um, uh, Samuel, it's good to have you back again. So, um, what Lawrence was saying was how important it is, as well as reading books like the book that I've been busily promoting, the online textbook. Uh, Bomni, I'm just going to um, I'm just going to um, put the slide up again so you can see what it's called. You're asking me what it's called. It is imaginatively called history mm -hmm. textbook. Yes, I, I'm, 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 so, um, I'd like to access it. <laughs> so if you can, uh, it's very, very easy to access. It's um, um, beautifully, uh, beautifully presented. And well done for the work you're doing, Samuel. <laughs> so this isn't Samuel's textbook, I have to say. Samuel is a history teacher in Ibadan and also a PhD student. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he did such a brilliant review about this online history textbook, which is the West African Senior School mm. Certificate Examination, that it, it really um, resonated with me. And I thought, well, this is certainly something that could be of 
real, real interest to to uh, mm. to people like me that can't read these huge, enormous. And, and the fact that he's getting young people. Uh, to be excited about history so much so that some of them are going to study it in university. I think that's incredible. <laughs> I think it's absolutely wonderful, isn't it? Yes. So uh, many congratulations. So for me, the, um, the, the, the thing is HTTPS dot dot okay. slash slash forward for, for slash. And then it's WASSCE, West African Senior School Certificate Examination, mm -hmm. historytextbook.com. I will look out for it. Mm -hmm. So that's excellent. And um, there's another, um, while well, I've got the uh, share on, uh, another book I wanted to include as well. And this book has just been translated into English. It's in English, it's called Woven. In Welsh, it was called Castel Sugar. And it's a book by Angharad Thomas. And Angharad took an interest in um, this, um, uh, uh, the story of weaving Welsh wool for use on the plantations as uh, um, the part of the provisions that were taken over from Liverpool. Um, and it's absolutely fascinating. So um, at the moment, my friend Caroline had, has uh, read the book and she's, she's commented on it. She was quite shocked by the honesty with which Ankarad told the story, which is all fiction. Uh, the story of two girls, one girl who was um, brought up on a, a farm uh, where sheep were cared for in mid Wales. And then she was, um, she uh, was given a position at Penryn Castle to work at Penryn Castle. And the time that she spent at Penryn Castle doesn't sound at all pleasant. Um, she was treated very badly and abused badly. Um, the story of the girl, because this is a story of two, this is a book that tells of two um, interwoven stories. And the girl from the Caribbean also had a really, really rough life as all enslaved people did who were working in the Caribbean. And um, so Ankara brings these two together. So um, when one or two of us have had a chance to, to read this text in English um, or have, a, have our Welsh colleagues uh, join us to share, share their perspectives on it, that'll be really interesting. So that was um, uh, another example of writing historical fiction. The other book that um, I mentioned there is The Fortune Man which is by um, Nafia Mohammed and Martin, who's joined us on many occasions earlier in the series. Um, he's going to try and, and find um, if Nafia would come and talk with us because this is a story of Welsh black history. And as some of you know, that's a particular area of interest to me. And it's a story about, um, about life in, um, in South Wales in the, the communities there that were um, uh, very, very mixed and challenging with the, the seamen and the um, uh, and the community, the Welsh community there. So, um, okay, well, that's a bit of a quick whistle stop tour through of um, uh, historical fiction. So, um, Lawrence, while you're with us, though, is there anything else that you you want to update us about or talk about what what's your latest project for writing i can't hear you lawrence i'm not so sure i want to talk about what i'm writing at the moment right. okay fine, um, fine but i would like to alert you though this because it is in, connected there's a new biography of clr james the great um trinidadian historian and academic and intellectual. Um, and it's going to be, a, um, there's a new biography. And of course, he's the author of Black Jacobins. Everybody would probably know that, the great history of Toussaint Louverture of Haiti. And I must say, when I read that book, it was it's a history book. It's a history, but it reads like, like a novel. It's so, it's got such pace. It's a marvelous, absolutely marvelous book. 
and he, there's going to be a discussion um, quite soon. Um, you'll discover it on the Royal Society of Literature website. Margaret Busby, who is the uh, Ghanaian Trinidadian publisher, um, is going to be discussing with a new Trinidadian novelist, Ayana Lloyd Barno, and um, Selma James, who was the wife of CLR James. Um, they're going to be discussing CLR's life as told in this new biography, um, which is by somebody from Wales, actually, I think. Um, so I I'm certainly going to try and zoom into that. Um, I can't remember the date offhand, but it will. you can find it on the Royal Society of Literature events for the spring um, that's coming up. Um, and just really, um, I might write to you about this again, Liz, just to remind you, I would quite like to do something on indentureship, which I did um, with my Golconda project some years ago. I have a, a, a PowerPoint and a talk and so on. So if you were interested in that, that would be great, yeah. Lawrence, that would be absolutely fantastic because our colleague, um, Dr. Jim Thakordin, has asked us for um, quite some time now to please do something about indentureship. His um, uh, uh, background um, was, his, his parents were indentured, his parents or grandparents were indentured labourers in um, Guyana. Right. And, um, uh, um, Janita's uh, also um, got a, a, a lot of, of knowledge about that too. And we also, at one time, I'd contacted David Dabberdeen. Yes, yes. But for him to speak, we'd have to put on a proper conference. <laughs> we'd be doing it all day. And I'm afraid the sheer logistics of running a proper conference are bit beyond me it gets to three in the morning I'm past yeah, it but David might want to just come in for a while or something I'm sure he's very busy yeah yeah well that would be really wonderful Lawrence what a um what a generous offer that is thank you so much and um and if you want to understand um more about the times of uh, England in 1802 then this is a this is a really, really ripping read. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Liz. <laughs> Highly enough. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. And we're going yeah. to continue our... Um, uh, Bunmi, was there anything else you wanted to ask or add? About historical fiction? Not just at the moment, right? Fine. Um, so um, we're now, though, going to carry on with the theme of. Um... Sorry, I, I forgot that my speaker was on mute. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> only, only for um, some more information about this launch of the CLR James book. I'm, it's something I'd really, really love to. Um, um, to you be couldn't a... look it up, to... could you, um, I, Lauren? I've, yeah, I've been trying to look it up. But I can't find. I can't seem to find it. So maybe if, yes, if you go to um, yeah. the Royal. Sorry, am, am I muted? No, the Royal Society of Literature website. The Royal Society. You, you will see. Um, there is the spring events. It's, so it's it's happening quite. Actually, I think. Have I got it in my diary? Um, right, we're just searching. I'm, I'm not very organised about it, but it is quite soon. And it will be very good because Margaret Busby was a, uh, the publisher of CLR James's books in the latter part of his life. Um, and it will be a good discussion. It's all Trin mostly Trinidadian um, authors with Selma James, who is British and was CLR's second wife, I think. Mm. Um, and is very, you know, very sort of lively activist person um, in women's women's studies and women's politics in London. Mm. Um, Selma, she. Um, Margaret Busby published Daughters of Africa. Yes, Margaret Busby. Um, yes, is the editor of Daughters of Africa. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. the second. It, you probably, I don't know, you might be in it yourself. I don't no, know. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many Daughters of Africa in it. Um, yes, that was M Margaret has done a second volume. Um, so that's it's, it's enlarged the number of 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 um, 
writers with African connections, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, but it's easy to find um, through the Royal Society of Literature um, in London. Royal Society of Literature. I yes. The Royal Society of Arts. No, the Sorry, Royal I'm Society of Literature. Time, time yes. uh, on me. It'll be on their website in a sort of spring event. Uh, it's, I've, I'm just looking at it on their website. It's the 20th of April. 20th of April, that's yeah, right. Yeah, it's Vital Discussions. Royal Society of Literature remembers C.L.R. James. Thanks very called. much for finding it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, do you mind putting that on the chat, please, um, Janita? Yeah, I will do. Thank you. Sometimes things mm. don't, <laughs> don't come up as easily from yes. over here as, as perhaps oh, over there. very lively people. It's a, it will be a very good, rich discussion, I'm sure. Wonderful. Well, I'm sure there's going to be more things that we can also catch up on. So thank you very much indeed for that. That's absolutely brilliant. Now, um, I can see, <laughs> I'm not sure what part of the globe you're on, <laughs> Janita, but you're sideways at the moment. Oh, I'm sideways, sorry. <laughs> Because I'm just putting a message in the chat and I'm on a mobile oh, phone. Fine. <laughs> That's fine. Can't oh. criticize you, but uh, I sometimes feel as if I ought to reverse mine upside down so you can see. I, I, I tell you what, Liz, I'll, I'll um, yeah. forward it in an email. All right. So I'm going to forward the now. details to you now. Yeah. So, now, so you June can. Elizabeth White Smith Gully um, has now joined us and has been getting her papers organised. I hope you didn't drive too fast. I hope you didn't get caught for speeding on the way oh, back. No, no, no. So, <laughs> June Elizabeth. Um, uh, oh dear, I've got the wrong page here. Um, right, I, uh, you sent me some, um, some illustrations. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. So, um, I think you're going to tell us about this work that you did in Northamptonshire and um, and, you, and the book that was written, Black British History, am I right? That's correct, yes. Oh, well, that's good news then. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Lawrence, and thank you, Bunny, and thank you, others. Stay with us because this is going to be interesting. This follows our theme of looking at local, Black history locally so that you can engage a local community in, in discussions on black history, rather than people thinking it's something that's to do with other people in other places, uh, is to bring in ownership. So over to you, uh, June Elizabeth, and Junita, if you're joining <laughs> us. Yeah, um, let's have a say. So, so good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. I am. My name's June Elizabeth, and I'll just make it short. I'm a Northamptonian born of Jamaican parents, and I am an international Windrush ambassador advocate. That's the best way to just cut it short. <laughs> and I'm joined with Juanita because she's staying the weekend to do some Windrush work. So when, when I was driving, we'd just gone to a 95 year old Windrush lady who gave a really nice story. Okay, I'm just going to briefly mention Black British history. And this book was sponsored by Northampton, the University of Northampton, Northampton Shears Black History Association and Northampton Shears County Council. About, oh, a few years ago. <laughs> um, so, yeah, about 12 years ago. So what about this book? The contents. So once I read the contents, I think um, you had it up on the screen. What happened? We got a lot of we got a lot of funding. One of the funding was half a million pounds. OK, <laughs> that's a lot of funding. And that was because the Heritage Lottery came to their realisation that there was nothing written um, that black people even, when I say black, people of colour even walked in Northampton. So some funding was given and 
we had a project and it was so successful it became a, a registered company and I used to deliver black history to the schools and etc cetera, etc cetera. so they had we managed to get into the university to do black history as part of, of a study there and the, the university called for 60 short studies and they said the best um, 13 they'll make a book and so the criteria was that it couldn't be more than 3,000 words and the contents I'll read to you that just the headlines amongst the aristocracy and underclass the lives of black people and attitudes to race in 18th century Britain that was by Anne Marie Sanders, Bristol and the Slave Trade by Harriet Smith, Henry Sylvester Williams, his achievements and influence by a Trinidadian named Maxim Ferrier, Claudia Jones by Eleanor Latchmore, Unsung Black British Heroes of the Second World War by Pauline Clark, West Indian Soldiers in World War II, Encounters with Bob Marley and his reggae music by myself. <clears throat> Rastafarism in Jamaica and Britain by Alicia Koloski. She married to a Polish, a Jamaican that married a Polish gentleman. And her dad was a Rasta in Jamaica and she was at the university in Northampton. Caribbean food from past to present by Shirley Brown Hill. She was a teacher in Wellingborough. Saik Dean Mohammed by Heather Knighton. Foreign Shores, A Brief History of Laskers in Britain by Joseph Bench. Sophie de Lipsing, Princess and Activist by Jean Bouch. Islamophobia, Historical Stereotypes and Changing Attitudes Towards Muslims in Britain by Babu Maiha. And what is very interesting that the, the, the authors of this publication, they range just like this black history conversation with white people, black people, people of all different races. And it's, the, the, the contents just tells you how um, varied the studies are. And somebody said to me, you know, tell me a bit about this book. So I'll just read the back. It says Black British History Selected Studies. This book presents a varied and fascinating collection of studies in Black British history, ranging across 300 years of Britain's links to Africa, North America, the Caribbean, and the Indian subcontinent. The selected studies fill important gaps in the generally received record of British history, providing readers with an opportunity to extend their understanding of this country's global past. The book is the product of an ongoing partnership between Northamptonshire Black History Association, which I was one of the co-founders and my husband and the University of Northampton. The part-time and full-time university students who wrote these studies have brought their experience as well as their enthusiasm to this research. And the book contains original analysis as well as much valuable information. So I'll just close with this <laughs> because somebody said to me, what is Bob Marley doing in Black British history? So I said, well, his dad was a white gentleman a white Jamaican from Clarendon. <laughs> and you smile when I say Clarendon, isn't it, um, Liz? Yeah. yeah. And um, but his his paternal grandparents were from Sussex and Liverpool. Yeah. So therefore, that's how I'm squeezing in the book. <laughs> yeah so um i had not only the pleasure of writing about bob marley but i also had the pleasure of meeting bob marley and um this book is on amazon uh but the thing is i just didn't 
know that he looked after so many people. You know, he was like a multimillionaire, which I didn't know at the time. Yeah. And he looked after thousands of people. And in closing, I was invited to his, to Hale Selassie, son, invited us to Swiss Cottage. This was like 1977, around that time. 77, 78, when Bob Marley was over here, because he was in exile after they tried to assassinate him in Jamaica. I didn't even know that he was, that was why he was here at the time. But when we got there, right, I thought to myself, I want to look cultured. So we got this African lady to give us a nice African style with some material in our heads, you know, wrap our heads. Because we, we're going to meet El Selassie's grandchildren, mm -hmm. right? So my friend Jackie from Brixton, when we got there, El Selassie's grandchildren, they had on westernized clothes. <laughs> and we said, I said, I hope they don't think that we're from Africa and start coming talking African to us, thinking we're direct. But this is what was fascinating. Um, El Selassie invited us to a uh, a dinner and a film show because when his father died he went into exile as last his son went into exile in Switzerland and Bob Marley had financed them for those years I'll just get it one second and well, he took nice. off his he took off his ring he took off his ring off his finger I don't know if you can see that because. and Bob Ma can you see it? Yeah, yeah. That's the only piece of jewellery Bob Marley ever wore. Yeah. And I was in Swiss Cottage when Bob Marley's son took that ring off and put it on Bob Marley's finger. And that's the only piece of jewellery he wore. And he gave him that as an appreciation, like a token of appreciation for him looking after him financially all those years when he was in Switzerland. So I salute Bob Marley and I went to his um, resting place in Jamaica and where he rested, you know, where and rest, rest his head was his Carl Graham was my pillar last night and Rupp was <laughs> my pillar too. And I went and paid tribute at his resting place. So God bless him. May he continue to rest in everlasting peace. He was an outer national, not international, outer national mm. superstar. And to me, he was like a musical prophet. Mm. So thank you very much for listening. Wow. Well, thank you very much indeed, June Elizabeth. That was fantastic. So a whistle stop tour. And I, I learned by my mistakes. Um, and you'll, you'll, if you've watched any few of these sessions, you'll you'll know what I get up to. Um, uh, I was just going back to the PowerPoint. Um, uh, let me, uh, all right, uh, Sean, you wanted to ask a question. You did that while I'm, oh, c uh, just a minute. Um, Rita, um, are you still there? Rita? Oh no, she's gone already. I'll have to, I'll have to email her. Sean, carry on, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, on what uh, June has said that, as usual, I think June has underplayed the work of the association because the other important publication they did in 2008 was this one, Sharing the Past, um, Northampton oh, right. Black History. And the other important bit about the association is it's black in the political sense. So it covers African, Caribbean, um, Asian history as well. It's not just um, uh, African and Caribbeans. Um, so, and that needs to be constantly, I think, kind of reminded that there are these links uh, and common themes that uh, span all the non-white communities in uh, in Britain. 
Yes, I'll just I'll just <coughs> say that we 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 use some of that funding and we pay people to train them to be interviewers to take the the um oh, history. oral history and we 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 um deposited over 200 oral history in our record office in the black history black association archives and so what we've done we employed people to go to the archives and take that history to make that book so i don't know if you you might have known julia bush <laughs> she was a professor at the university and it was a bank holiday she rang me she said we're in trouble she said i'm a troubleshooter not a troublemaker yeah so she rang me and she said can you help us out because so i'm one of the editors that helped with that <laughs> book they they sending it to the publisher you know when you got deadlines but mm -hmm. um there was some things that didn't make sense so only somebody like myself that was born here and know the community could make it make sense because they had one gentleman saying when he went to the west indian club they used to dance upstairs and play pool downstairs and then another gentleman was saying that you know everything was downstairs so i just showed them well that's because they moved clubs <laughs> when that gentleman came in the 80s they'd already moved from the original club which was the oldest west indian club in england mm -hmm. right at the time and there was a, a couple of sisters so like me and juanita are sisters now and she's the doctor of philosophy and i'm the windrush ambassador then they'd muddled us up but because we're married we different name they didn't know we would belong to, we're the white sisters yeah so i was able to mm -hmm. tweak and fix things so that it kind of <laughs> made a bit of sense so some of the people are, would, would go to the black history association i've got to say this and we we had to make sure that we delivered so we had a white lady from london who was the director, another white lady was Italian, who was the archivist in Bedford. And then we had a lady of mixed race who was a community relation from Northampton. So some black people used to go and say to these white ladies, what are you doing in charge of black people history? Yeah, so I used to say to them, anytime you get any problem, just, just let me know. And then, you know, I can talk with the people. And I'll say like, hey, Miss O'Brien, why, why are you making fuss? I said, the thing is, you, 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 you're a treasurer and you cannot do maths. You give your friend a job to be a secretary and he can't read and write. So with this, we didn't deal with colour. We, we did it properly through oh. the spreadsheets and shortlisting. And we've got the best people who are doing the job. So then they, then they come and apologize to the people that became part of the, 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 <laughs> the, the, the project. And, you know, so I, I can infiltrate anything in my town because mm -hmm. people know me and they respect me. And the project was very, very um, successful. And thank you for that, Sean. I didn't want to bring that book up because um, I just wanted to deal with managing time i think i might have shown it before very quickly yeah so that's an excellent book yes okay i'll shut up now <laughs> oh, don't worry don't worry june elizabeth that's absolutely fine <coughs> um, and uh, i gather your sister's there um Renita. um Renita, were you going to join in at this stage at all squeezing in there so what i'd just like to talk about for a few moments because we've got several people here who are very interested in the windrush generation and um and stories of uh, well most of the stories of black people in in the uk so run me and samuel if you'll you'll bear with us um because in season six this is the last session of season five we've managed five seasons and i think we're up to something like 66 sessions which is just absolutely remarkable and i thank everybody who's been involved all the way through but um 
with the opportunity to apply for funding for Windrush Day, um, I got my imagination working and um, put forward a, a proposal, which we haven't heard of the outcome of, but it's such a good idea anyway, we'll see what we can do. Um, and that is um, to look at the story of Windrush over several of our sessions. So sessions might be a little bit like this session with different topics and different speakers. So um, the story that hasn't really, I don't think, been told here about Windrush is the story of the departure and those people who were left behind and those people who went back. So that's one of the things that we want to look at. So we'll um, do an introductory session. We'll do a special session on the actual anniversary of the departure from Jamaica. And I've got Jamaican colleagues working on that to talk about that. Bill, you've talked about the fact that you'll help us with the actual, um, you know, the passenger list of the wind rush and be telling us some of those stories. But we're also going to keep going in the, I think there's four weeks, because the journey took four weeks, four weeks until the anniversary of the arrival and part of the funding requires you to do something on the, on the anniversary of the arrival, which is Windrush Day. Um, so then I, I thought in those four weeks, um, uh, June Elizabeth, Juanita, Bill, um, David, you'll tell us about um, uh, uh, am I right here? Footballers and uh, army. Uh, we want the why are West Indians here? People who are focusing on the contribution of um, African Caribbean and other uh, people from other parts of the um, British Empire in in World War One and World War Two. So, um, so this is going to be a mix, Anita. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if you'd approached Arthur Torrington. No, but I will. He, he's okay. ob an obvious, isn't he, from um, the Windrush Foundation? Yeah, I just think if you're doing a programme throughout, he's he's always willing to um, contribute to different organisations. So he's just worth contacting. Would you mind passing his contact on to me? Anita? Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll email it to you. And anyone else that you can think of. Bill okay. and David, are either of you with us at the moment, or are you right? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm here. I've come I've come off mute because there's a, there's a lull in activity in our bathroom, so it's a bit it's quieter here at the moment. But there, there's been some loud banging going on previously. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, well, I'm glad that's you're explaining that. Thank you, Samuel. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, and yes, I'd love to uh, meet your students. Um, Samuel's just put a message in the, the chat saying that uh, he's got to go now to attend to his students. Um, and some of the um, students have listened to the various discussions via external speaker and all are impressed and they'd like to, to meet you. Well, we can have a special session and we can, uh, can bring some speakers to, to talk with your your students in Ibadan, I'm sure, Samuel. So thank you so much for joining us. And I, I feel this is the beginning of a very positive relationship. OK, bye, Samuel. And Bill, you were saying <laughs> now it's quieter in the bathroom. Yeah, I mean, what, what you were suggesting, Liz, definitely it's a great idea. I mean, we could talk about footballers who are typical Windrush generation. Viv yeah. Anderson being a great example. And we can talk about specific passengers on the Windrush as well. You know, yes. why they were coming across what happened when they got here what happened yeah. to them afterwards and so on. i mean there's some beautiful stories um you know not not everybody made it you know some people went back so there's the whole cross section of uh, of different stories to tell i think what is interesting is that i know colleagues who came over either on the well no, I don't know people who came out on the Windrush, but I know people who came in latter years to either study or to just have an experience of the mother country. Went back to um, Jamaica, where I particularly have friends, and and have done very well. Thank you. Um, you know, it was it wasn't just that people came to Britain and then got caught, like whatever you might say in aspic. Um, so, so that sounds absolutely fascinating. David, are you going to chirp in? Um, no, I mean, not. I think Bill's kind of the real expert on the Windrush, but I mean, um, what you said about the passenger list is interesting. 
pe knowing people who are on the Windrush, because quite often people come up and say, oh, yeah, my dad was on the Windrush or my uncle was one on the Windrush. And I say, well, hang on a minute, I can check the passenger list. And of course, you yeah. find out that they weren't. Um, but actually, only yesterday, my wife said, oh, a teacher friend of hers, whose surname was Montague, said, oh, uh, her, I think it was her father was on the Windrush. And I said, well, I'll check the passenger list, expecting as usual that he wasn't there. But of course, there actually were two people named Montague on the Windrush. So um, Roxanne will be going back to her friend and saying, which one was he? So, so um, yeah, there were there were actually people on the Windrush, uh, probably fewer than people who claimed to have been on the Windrush, but nonetheless, there were people on it. That's fantastic. I, I spoke to and uh, Levi uh, Lawrence has, has joined us on this pro, uh, sessions before now. He's here in Melbourne and I was just chatting to him one day. I recognise his accent. He comes from Birmingham. So I, I was uh, clued into that. And uh, Levi said that his dad was on the Windrush. So sure enough, we checked it out and he was on the Windrush and he's uh, recorded his story. That That's absolutely fascinating. And he he was, uh, I'm not saying the others weren't, but he was a very bright guy. And so he actually analyzes um, the experience of the journey and analyzes what life was like in Britain. So that will be really interesting. And also, Bill, one of the things I'd love you to look out for is that our Jamaican colleagues who I'll, I'll invite you to talk with them before we do the departure, thing because one of the um, passengers was a child, a girl who was about three. Do you have a recollection of children? Yeah, there were, there were many children on board. Um, Dorinda Stewart's probably the most famous one, but there's a lady in Banstead, Surrey, who was uh, a child on board who's still going strong. Um, there were the Zane family. There, there were some, so yeah, there, there were quite a few young children on board. Fantastic, because one of um, our colleagues, Yasa Safari, has been talking to um, a number of people with this idea. Before COVID, they had the idea they were going to have a big celebration on the on the dock for the departure. But next year, I think it's the it's a special anniversary next 75th year. Seventy fifth anniversary, isn't it? Seventy fifth. Yeah. So they definitely, and they want to have some sort of a, a memorial on the um, on the waterfront in Kingston. Um, and one of the people who was um, uh, who was involved in the discussion, she said, I think she said she was one of the children. I can't remember the story. We'll have to work it out. So thanks ever so much, Bill. Now, um, Juanita's got her hand up, I think. Juanita? Hi. No, I just wondered, um, Liz, if any, or and I think um, Bill may know, if anybody's got information about what actually happened on the journey between those who came from the Caribbean and then those who were, I don't know, from Mexico, they had a lot of the Polish people, um, you know, because the passenger, the, I think it's 1,227 people who are actually on board the ship. And it's just interesting that it was a lot more mixed than it's ever really represented. Mm -hmm. People always kind of just show it's just, you know, people coming from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, but I always wondered about the camaraderie that might have happened on the ship and and or relationships that might have built up on the ship and you know because um i don't know i think the the term windrush or windrush generation is slowly expanding to encompass a lot of people who just came during that period so it's broadening out to other members of the commonwealth but also just thinking about the fact that actually a lot of people from poland came on that ship as well but yeah. i don't know if, yeah what i would say um to conclude that is that um sam king right he yeah. he took all those people's he done the directory that's how come we've got the list so as um Juanita says if you talk with arthur arthur it, it, i mean i've i've really studied everything the Windrush Foundation, if you go into it, yeah. it's like yeah. volumes. It's yeah. so interesting. But also what I wanted to mention was when we mentioned it, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, and you said that you wanted to really talk to people who had been left behind. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you had got hold of Benjamin Zafaria. 
Uh, and Benjamin's Benjamin. a denier. Uh, yeah. yeah. Because he he was he calls himself a Windrush child because he was left behind when his dad came on that ship and he wrote the book what I showed you. If you're not able to to um, get get him, because I think you said you 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 might know him, of him, yeah. You and uh, was it Audrey? Yes, if he's so not a, yeah, if he's not available, I don't mind presenting something from his story when he was left behind. It's very, very interesting. Indeed. Very, very interesting. Very much indeed. You know? He's very detailed of going to saying goodbye to his dad, you know, and, he, and going back to Maroon Town to his granny and his mum, you know, and how it affected his life. And then when he joined his dad mm. and had to say goodbye, you know, it's very moving. Yes. Yeah, and Benjamin did attend um, a couple of our football pioneers events because he's interested in football as well. And uh, at one of those events, Roxanne, my wife, did a reading from uh, uh, from the, 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 that book, uh, and he was listening, so it was quite quite daunting. But he won't. He said he wouldn't do the listening himself because he's just he, he wouldn't do the reading himself because he's dyslexic, so he doesn't actually do readings. But he was certainly very approachable, and he was certainly, I think, uh, is worth getting in contact with him. Yes, it would be really good. I, I've met him through Yasa Safari, but really sort of on the poetry front and, and, and things to do with Rasta. And the other thing I was going to ask you about June Elizabeth with your gorgeous locks um, is that we haven't actually done a, a session about Rastafari. Um, and Yasa Safari joined us for the first five or six sessions, I think. It's very difficult timing from Jamaica at the moment. It's it's um, five hours. It's not any easier. It was this. It was this sort of time because in Jamaica at the moment, I'm just looking at my list on the wall, so I know what time it is in places. So it's about seven o'clock now. But these programs would start at six o'clock, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, because I think we may have to adjust the time. I've already talked to Simon a little bit about it. But it would be great to do a session within the Windrush things about Rastafari, because Rastas in the UK were generally, according to my colleagues Hapti Wald and McCarpy uh, Selassie, um, they generally were, um, well, they're more or less my age. They're in the 60s, 70s now, who... Um, turned to Rastafari from the music because they didn't feel that that their, their schooling was really had met, met their needs for their identity. And there's lots of things around that. Right. So I've got something that is very interesting. The first Rastafarian, the first Rasta um, organization in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. And I've I'll show you a picture. It's very selected people that see the picture. And my husband was the secretary in oh. the early days. Well, know, where was it? Where was the organization? It's based in Labrook Grove. So oh, right. I've got I've got like the archive. <laughs> and my husband also, the, the, the Jamaican um, university. University of Jamaica of the West Indies, they mm -hmm. were not um, familiar with um, Ethiopia and you know being a like a, a the religion and everything about Ethiopia being a, a, a like a what do you call it? Uh, oh, it's gone out of me. Not a fantastic yeah. place it was. Yes. So, so um, my husband had to write special papers and send it to the University of Jamaica of the West Indies and they sent delegates over to Ethiopia yeah. but then they they passed by England on their way yeah it's a really fantastic story and so my husband said when he was writing the paper you know it didn't seem right to be saying the Rasta man yeah. so he coined the Rastafarian my husband coined that. Rastafarian, yeah, Rastafarian. He was, the one, he was, the, he was Look, the one that coined that me. name to put it in the, the yeah. put it right. 
It seems to me that Alf Woolley, <laughs> your husband, needs to come on the show one week, on the session one week, because yeah. it would be so, so good. And we have we have one one program. We did a bit of research about the time Haile Selassie spent in the UK. So I find that very fascinating because he used to village, yes. visit my village in Worcestershire because yeah. his daughters were at school in Malvern. Okay. So there's a lot of interesting well, they stories. in Brighton. Yeah. yeah. But actually, um, have you seen where um, Haile Selassie was based in Bath? Yes. Yeah. And then, but so they've they've turned the house now into a place where, well, it's, it's kind of like a Rastafarian commune, right? But there's a there's a there's a um, there's somebody who's doing a lot of research on the history of that building and its relationship to the Rastafarian community. Um, and I'll send you his details as well. Like that, that it, it's um, it'll cut the name will come to me, but it's just not quite there. Yeah. <laughs> Is his name Sean? Oh, you know Sorry. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's Sean. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that would be wonderful. I, I, we had a heritage we learning links. In, no, I think it was Jamaica two thousand. We had a heritage lottery funded um, a bid, and like you, um, June Elizabeth, it was quite well funded. And so, um, and, and like your project, there were white people involved as well, including me, who was managing the finance of it all and, and the project. And uh, we did that focus on that was Rastafari in the West Midlands. And so we followed up a number of these stories, but it was before the advent of easy to access, easy to maintain websites. And so a lot of the research that we did and found out um, isn't easily accessible and I can't remember now what I've left behind in the UK because I left all the yeah. folders just as they were when we finished the project so yeah. that would that would just be fascinating so I'd love to talk to Alf sometime and we can come up with a, a yeah. proposal for that but I think these are different ways of looking at the Windrush story because it's not just the Empire Windrush it's like as um uh, Anita was saying it's the the wider implications of the Windrush generation, and then it's the you know the the other things that perhaps haven't been because I've never um, I've thought about it several times, but we've never actually included a presentation about Rastafari. I can't remember if we did it in our last year's conference. We might have done, but we'll we'll follow that up. Right, um, Sean. Right, yeah. Um... Because one of the things is that putting the information can be not known about. So, for instance, um, I knew about the uh, model head of um, Ali Salasti at Canizario House in Wimbledon. Um, but I had to tell the St Agnes Place Rastafarian group that it existed because they didn't know. Um, oh which you know is interesting um and he does appear in plenty of places over the, uh, over the country uh but he was based for a while uh in wimbledon and was um welcomed in wimbledon and um uh had um, important local people supporting him um Right, that's all I want to say on that. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, I, Dunham Massey, we went to Dunham Massey at one stage because he was very friendly with um, Lord, whatever his name is, who was at Dunham Massey, and, um, and talked with the National Trust along with the um, one of the Rastafari group, I can't remember which one it was, 12 tribes, I think, in Manchester. And they actually celebrated Haile Selassie's birthday in the way that the... Earl, I think he was. The Earl would celebrate it, and they flew the Rasta flag on Dunham Massey. <laughs> that was a real achievement. My next achievement in life is going to be flying the Jamaican flag on Penryn Castle. <laughs> That'll be a good one. Okay, so I'm going to begin to wrap up now because um, there's a launch event for this um, um, uh, the project that Marcia was talking about. Um, 
Okay, so last week we welcomed Marika Sherwood, and that was that was so so much fun. It was really lovely to see her and to see people who'd known her over the years and to recognise and value the great work she'd done. And we ought to recognise and value the great work that you've done as well, Sean, because obviously working together and uh, and I know the uh, the publications you came out with, and it's fascinating. And what I was going to say um, uh, just in in wrapping up a little bit was that. Um, that also um, during Elizabeth, um, when I saw that it was the Northamptonshire Black History Society, I automatically assumed it was Northamptonshire Black History, not having read the small print. So I'll try and get hold of a copy of that because it sounds absolutely fascinating. And I think books that um, include a whole range of different aspects for people to, to you know, articles to read through might make for easier reading. Just to let you know the other things that I found out this week. Um, this was interesting. This was in the uh, New Yorker. Um, a really interesting article telling the truth and saying that the British Empire was much worse than you realise. So a whole article on that. So if you want the information there, that's uh, an interesting one. And. It was based on the um, on Caroline Elkins uh, book, which I think may may be a relatively recent publication, but don't hold me to that. Um, and that's called The Legacy of Violence, a history of the British Empire. That's a not so good news history. Um, I also just wanted to mention that um, Elio Vale at Yale, um, who I ought to know better apparently came from North Wales. So this is really a reminder for my colleagues who are interested in Welsh black history. And I don't know if you can see in the biggest picture that there is a, um, a small black child in the illustration. And it says at the bottom, attended by a child slave. Interesting wording then. But um, he's buried in, in Wrexham, Wales, and it's his name that Yale University is um, named after. I'm just seeing if there's anything else interesting I've fished out. Oh, this is fascinating. Now that Jim Thakordin, um, Dr. Jim Thakordin passed this on and it's called the Zin Education Project. And it's about teaching a people's history and it teaches about the black history of the United States and that's Absolutely fascinating. So that's the zinedproject.org. There's loads of resources on there. And Jim thought perhaps we might be able to do something similar. Um, well, perhaps we might. I've also made a note here that Amend, which um, is uh, a series on Netflix, but it's also on YouTube, um, is a fantastic um, story which um, goes chronologically through the history of black, the, the black history of the United States and also the 1619 project. So what I'm beginning to do is to collect information about um, the history of particular countries or particular areas in the country, which is why I made the mistake about the Northamptonshire. This um, was a new some new writing, but I haven't got the reference for this, so I'll have to go back to it again. And this is um, a, a link to an essay on the visible, invi the visible invisibility of black people in art um, with particular focus on the boy with the pearl earring, um, which you can see there, the decorative art of slavery. So, um, yeah, and uh, just a reminder that um, Back to African history, the UNESCO General History of Africa in eight volumes, but in 20 odd episodes, which might be easier. That was what I wanted to mention earlier to Samuel. So I'll stop sharing that now. And thank you all very much for contributing. It's been a really interesting session. So we're wrapping up season five and we're looking forward to season six. So uh, when we finish recording, if a few of you could stay on, I just want to ask a few questions about timings. Um, so is there anything anybody else wants to add? No, in that case then, Simon, if you stop the recording then, and thank you very much indeed. See you after Easter. Are you there, Simon? <laughs> a lot of our programme 
comes in with this either, Simon. <laughs> All right, Simon, are you going to wrap up the recording, please?